Hello, everyone, and welcome to Revival Lost Southern Voices, a festival for readers, where we celebrate historically excluded, erased, or marginalized Southern authors whose works are either out of print or don't get the attention they deserve. I'm Gina Flowers, an Associate Chair uh, of English at Georgia State University Perimeter College and Director of Revival Lost Southern Voices. On behalf of GSU Perimeter College and the Georgia Center for the Book, we welcome you to Revival Lost Southern Voices 2023. By the end of our four-day festival, our goal is for each of you to have a nice long reading list of authors who are new to you that you can read, enjoy, share, and help us revive those voices. Uh, as a start to that reading list, a further reading link will appear soon in the chat, and the link to the full program will also appear in the chat. So you can learn more about our authors and our presenters and more about our remaining panels uh, for the rest of the conference. So please enjoy, please join us for those. A bit of Zoom housekeeping before we get started. Uh, at the top or the bottom of your screen, you will see several symbols. There is a Q&A where we ask you to put your questions. That helps us make sure that we see all of your questions and they don't get lost in the chat. The chat feature is for you to actively um, interact with the other panelists or the other attendees and the panelists. So please feel free to enter things in the chat during the presentations. And then also the closed caption feature is active. All you have to do is click on CC. The closed caption will appear. You can also adjust, adjust the font size if you'd like for that feature. So our moderator for today's panel is Dr. Andy Rogers. Our panel is called Voices of the American and Global South. Uh, Dr. Andy Rogers, who along with Pearl McHaney, co-founded Revival Lost Southern Voices in 2017. He serves as Associate Chair of English at the Decatur campus of GSU Perimeter College, and he is also the co-founder of the GSU Prison Education Project. Andy's scholarly work has appeared in Salinger, the New York Times best-selling biography of J.D. Salinger by Shane Salerno and David Shields. Now, in the spirit of celebrating Southern authors, I welcome you all, and I turn the program over to our moderator, Dr. Andy Rogers. Andy? Thank you, Gina. I'd like to introduce each of our distinguished panelists, and I'm very excited to be moderating this panel. Um, Anthony Grooms was originally scheduled and had a conflict, and I hate to say I was excited, but I'm definitely grateful to be able to, to moderate this panel. Um, so our panelists, um, first of all, uh, Jeffrey B. Leak. He's Interim Associate Dean of the Honors College at the University of North Carolina at Charlotte. He's the editor of Racing to the Right, Selected Essays of George S. Schuyler, Racial Myths and Masculinity in African-American Literature, and Visible Man, The Life of Henry Dumas, whom he's presenting on today. Uh, he is currently working on a social history of African-American writers and white European editors of the 1950s and 60s. Uh, our second presenter will be Dr. Ebony Lumumba. She's an associate professor of English at Jackson State University, where she chairs the Department of English, Foreign Languages, and Speech Communication. She received her PhD in English Literature from the University of Mississippi, a Master of Arts in English from Georgia State University, uh, graduated movement magna cum laude from Spelman College with a Bachelor of Arts in English. Ebony specializes in transnational Black women's writing and post-colonial literatures of the global South. Ebony is an active scholar with publications that include a chapter in From Uncle Tom's Cabin to the Help, Critical Perspectives on White Authored Texts of Black Life, an article in the Eudora Welty Review titled Caught in the Act of Living, Welty is a voyeur and witness of Black Life, a chapter titled The Matter of Black Lives in American Literature, Eudora Welty's Nonfiction and Photography in Teaching the Works of Eudora Welty, 21st Century Approaches, and a chapter in the collection New Essays on Welty, Class, and Race titled Demonstration of Life, Signifying for Social Justice in Eudora Welty's The Demonstrators. 
The forthcoming book chapters include Love This Flesh, Sensu Sensuality as a Trauma Response in Toni Morrison Novels, in the Rutledge uh, Research Companion to Toni Morrison, and Capturing Power, Black Women's Political and Economic Agency in Welty's Photography and Writing in, Eur in Eudora Welty, Multimedia Interactions and Modernisms. She writes, teaches, and thinks most about Black women's liberation and resistance. And she'll be presenting way to more very exciting emerging uh, writer. Um, finally, uh, uh, Brennan Collins is the Associate Director of the Center for Excellence in Teaching, Learning, and Online Education at Georgia State University for High Impact Practices, Digital Pedagogy, and Atlanta Studies. He is also Director of the Teagle Foundation funded experiential project based interdisciplinary also called EPIC program. The interdisciplinary nature and technology focus of this program allows him to work with a diverse faculty in exploring inventive pedagogies. He is particularly interested in creating transdisciplinary and interinstitutional projects and platforms that explore the urban landscape to develop student critical thinking and create opportunities for community engagement. This work explores the intersection of the humanities with the emerging fields of mapping, di digital heritage, data visualization and curation, and immersive learning. He teaches courses in multi-ethnic US literature and comics. And he will be presenting Raymond Andrews, who was actually the original inspiration for Lost Southern Voices to get started in the first place. We wanted to do something to recognize Raymond Andrews. All right, so welcome to all of our panelists. And we will start uh, with Jeffrey Leake presenting Henry Dumas. Thank you. All right. Thank you all uh, for inviting me. It's uh, a nice getaway from administrative work, as many of you, I'm sure, uh, understand. I'll try to share my screen, make sure you have that, and then I'll uh, commence. All right. <clears throat> as we venture into our discussion about revival and the recovery of lost Southern voices, Let's remember, please, that not everyone is lost equally. Some writers could be long gone from this world and others could still be here, navigating through a literary or cultural world that refuses to see them. In the case of Henry Dumas, he certainly felt invisible, hence his quip to his friends and primarily tongue in, in tongue in cheek fashion to novelist Ralph Ellison, see me, look at me. I'm here, I'm not invisible. Hence my decision to title the biography, Visible Man, The Life of Henry Dumas. In thinking about how we revive or introduce Henry Dumas to current and new generations of readers, we have to establish his literary legacy and its evolving relevance to African-American life and the human journey. I think my fellow panelists have had more materials to make the literary cases for their subjects. All of the books under Dumas's name were published posthumously. So there's a body of work to consider, yes, but there are obvious challenges associated with assessing and exploring poetry and fiction that the author never saw in final form. Through the efforts of his wife, Loretta Dumas, and literary executor, Eugene B. Redman, Dumas's collected short fiction has been republished. And that's what you see on the screen here uh, in 2021, Echo Tree, his collected short fiction. <clears throat> My biographical work, along with writers and scholars who have reviewed the biography and offered incisive readings of Dumas's creative oeuvre, uh, has contributed to a kind of Dumas revival. The challenge of invoking the term revival though, requires us to think about what aspects of the Dumas story in his writing, in his life, or both, compel contemporary readers to learn about and read the creative musings of this man from Sweet Home, Arkansas. For me, the scholarly attention on Dumas emerges in two primary areas. First, the volatile circumstances of his death, and second, the seemingly prophetic exploration of both an African diasporic past 
and future. And here I will uh, try to go to my next slide. Uh, so you can, right. there we go. And here I just want, wanted to give you some sense of the books that have been published uh, of his fiction and poetry. And uh, primarily initiated by Toni Morrison when she was an editor at Random House. And so she reprinted a number of his uh, books and printed for the first time his posthumous uh, novel, Genoa and the Greenstone. And so this is just uh, a, a sample basically of, or, or the collected works of, of Dumas. So I'll continue on. I'll start, as I said, the, there are two sort of areas that I have put folks in with regard to uh, looking at and considering Dumas's work. Uh, one, those who focus on his death, and then two, those who look at him uh, in terms of synthesizing an African past and future. I'll start with his death in 1968 at the hands of a white transit officer in Harlem. In reviving discussions about Dumas's writing over the last 10 to 12 years, this has occurred in the context of the excessive number of fatal Black encounters with police. In other words, the American narrative related to inhumane and racist treatment of Black men and women by police has often resulted in reading Dumas primarily in that context, given how he died uh, some uh, number of weeks after Dr. King was assassinated, uh, that becomes the narrative, another Black man uh, taken down. And not that that's not true, but that's not all that there was. I'm sorry, my phone was going off. Uh, so uh, the American narrative related to inhumane and racist treatment of Black men and women often dominates uh, reflections about Dumas. On the surface, that makes sense. But even his widow acknowledges that Henry's encounter with that officer was more nuanced. Nevertheless, the basic facts around his death for legitimate and understandable reasons emerge in the protests and demands of the Black Lives Matter movement for police accountability. Probably, the article or story about Dumas with the largest audience is titled, Henry Dumas wrote about black people killed by cops. Then he was killed by a cop, which appeared and was heard on national public radio. The author was uh, or is Benish Ahmed. Uh, I was interviewed for the story and it certainly covers more than the facts related to his death but the title of the story reflects the volatile social reality that Black people must navigate. In this scenario, Henry is an early example of what the Black artist must confront. And yes, examples do emerge. Uh, examples of this do emerge in breathtaking fashion in his fiction. And, and so, I, 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 again, uh, the article that I alluded to is a pretty long one, but if one is just glancing at the title of the article or just skims it, they could come away uh, primarily focused on how he died, not how he lived or what he created uh, in his lifetime. So th th that's the, the challenge. Uh, for, for me at least. For creative writers and scholars, Dumas emerges as literary and cultural seer. Whether it's two young boys who come upon an ancient soul ship in the story Ark of Bones, or a young black man in the story Fawn, 
imbued with the spiritual force to defeat two clansmen who were determined to teach him the lesson of Emmett Till. Some of the most profound commentaries, like that of Carter, Carter Mathis and Lavelle Porter, marvel at Dumas's ability to reimagine and synthesize the ancient world of Black antiquity with the contemporary iteration of Black voice, instrumental sound, and the soul-stirring power of the Black collective voice. And, and again, uh, Lavelle Porter and Carter Mathis have written uh, some of the, uh, I'd say, most nuanced and, and long, right, uh, or lengthy treatments of not only the life of Dumas, but his work, right? And, and I think it's important with authors who are on the periphery for whatever reasons, it's important to let people know that they do have a, a, a body of work to uh, take into consideration, right? Sorry about that, let's see. For these students of Dumas, uh, examples that, that you see on the screen, including the late Amiri Baraka, he's often referred to as an Afrofuturist, a literary seer clearly in correspondence with the Black past in preparation for a Black future symbolized in the music and imagination of musicians like Sun Ra. Most of, or, or if not most, a significant number of uh, articles uh, in journals and magazines uh, related to Dumas over the last seven to 10 years focus on his uh, exploration of sound and, and, and music and, and sort of the, the science of music uh, in, in interesting ways, jazz, experimental jazz, blues, things of that nature. In his poetry and short stories, Dumas points both backward and forward. The American way, if we follow the lead of the Declaration of Independence, only looks forward. For us, we need to read Dumas and other writers on the literary periphery so that we might finally see what needs to be seen. Thank you. All right, thank you. And um, so I'll move to our next presenter. So Dr. Lumumba presenting a way to more. Thank you so much. And I'm going to share screen for just a moment um, once Jeffrey's screen is, there we go. Thank you everyone for joining us virtually. It's still exhilarating to be able to present even when you're not in the room. So I, I titled this sort of uh, talk slash meditation, uh, Whispering in the Wind, Black Women's Resistance in the Work of Wyatt Two Moore. And I want to clarify that when I'm talking about, we're talking about lost voices and Gina brought this up earlier in a sort of pre-panel discussion that Wyatt Two Moore is obviously not a lost voice. She's an emerging voice, but I'm contextualizing my comments about her today uh, considering how Afro histories are lost and the work that Wyatt Two Moore is doing in her uh, in her premiere novel, uh, she would be king to reclaim uh, lost Afro histories. As, and I'm also touching upon the way that Black women's voices, both socially and within the literary marketplace, uh, can be silenced in a number of uh, overt and subversive ways. Lastly, this concept of Southern spaces uh, that uh, the way that sort of false narratives about what Southern spaces are and what contextualize the South often contributes to both of those, those mentions that I made before, to those Afro histories being lost and to Black women being silenced. And so I want to mention that going in, that that is the approach that I'm taking to positioning Wyatt to more as, as uh, sort of ripe for this discussion. The elders say 
that where you find a suffering village, you hear the wind give warning. Liberian, Liberian American writer Wyatu Moore opens the second chapter of her 2018 debut novel, She Would Be King, with this West African proverb that ties the providence and destiny of the chapter's setting, antebellum Virginia, to the ancestral wisdom and supernatural rootedness of Africa. Despite the scores of enslaved Black bodies historically victimized on this Southern land, Moore engages the cultural concept of Sankofa, taking from the past to guide the future and corrects the lens we've typically used when viewing and storying the American South. We are warned that the Emerson plantation is not only the prototypical ecosystem of vast inequities and violence of American slavery, but that the Virginia farmland bears responsibility to a world and a people across the Atlantic. The geopolitical struggle for Southern identity for African diasporic cultures and the blurring of space performed in this moment is pervasive throughout this novel. Here and into the global spaces of Jamaica and Liberia, Moore ties Southern space to Black folklore and crafts a narrative that resurrects the Black bodies fallen to racial, the racial violence of chattel slavery. Though owned by and named for a white planter class man in the natural realm, the Emerson plantation is possessed by a supernatural being who is not white and not male. The wind that warns is Charlotte, originally a 19 year old enslaved woman who exists as nothing more than property. To buttress the wealth of her owner, she is forgotten in life. In the novel, she describes herself as so plain with skin that is not pitch black, not yellow, nothing to make fuss over. A frame not tall, not short, like spilled water or mist line hung sheets targeted by a windstorm in life, Charlotte feels that she is thrown around the plantation, forgettable and forgotten. She is the allegory of the tragic and frequent marginalization of black female voices in Southern literature. Charlotte's palpable loneliness does not persist in the novel, however. The Afrofuturist author uh, Wyatt Tumor res resists Afro-pessimism and almost by sleight of hand passes Charlotte into the supernatural realm where she becomes ubiquitous, knowing, known, and all-powerful. She becomes the wind. Charlotte's death is as unnoticeable as her life. Her limp body lays in the dirt where she falls after being accidentally murdered for attempting to protect another enslaved girl for hours. Owing to the disregard she experiences in life, Charlotte fails to notice that she no longer exists in the natural realm. She becomes accustomed to being ignored, accepts it as her lot. The image projected onto her by a racist society becomes her identity. However, Moore rescues the character from eternal dispossession. In death, Charlotte is finally seen. A brutalized enslaved man named Day is the only one who can see her spiritual body. Day shows Charlotte her grave, and in this existential revelation, she notes, I was seen, he could see me. Charlotte and Day's intimacy is not sexual, yet their closeness yields a son, June Day, or Moses, born of an ethereal mother and a mortal father with uncanny spiritual intuition. As the wind, Charlotte becomes an earth mother that protects, advises, comforts other characters, including her son, as they struggle with the concept and attainment of Black liberation across the global South. Moore, Moore imbues Black characters across her text with various supernatural capabilities that tie them to nature and a deep sense of awareness that evades those blinded by white hegemonic ideals. In this way, the author allows the wind to warn us that our village, our world, the South, is suffering. And in alignment with Afrofuturist expression, Moore's novel centers resistance work and gender equity. In her novel and across the Afrofuturist canon, Black women lead armies, rule nations, and develop technology. While writing Black women as integral in the future agitates narratives that marginalize and dismiss Black people and corrects the historical narratives that discount the contributions and immense worth of Black women in centuries past. The Black female characters at the center of these narratives often descend from long lines of matrilineal power. Thus, 
Afrofuturism responds to the inequities of representation and discrimination in ways Blackness is deleted from narratives of the past and the future. Our future world through an Afrofuturist lens does not forget those history has forgotten. Black women are central to Moore's novel and work. The main character of She Would Be King, Bessa, opens the novel. Her obscure birth and ability to survive crowns Bessa as the one who would be king were she a man. What is remarkable about Moore's characterization of Black women in her text is that they are not overt or immediate in their heroism. Their strength and ability are focused, are fostered rather, by communities that relegate them to misrepresentation and exile. Charlotte goes unnoticed in her natural life and unmissed in her death. However, Moore creates a scenario where her value is established by those who would see her, those who had eyes to see, unblighted by tainted power structures and inequitable entitlement. In her self-realized state as the wind, we cannot live without her. Ships do not sail without her. Life stops. Bessa is deemed a curse from the day she is born and banished from her village for her fiery red hair. Her community calls her a witch and like Charlotte attempts to map out a damned destiny for her. In Bessa's self-realization, she is a savior who resurrects and reminds us that she will not die. Thus, we will not die. Moore repositions these invisible women as integral to the preservation of the world. The benefit of being ridiculed, cast out, forgotten, and dead is that they are taken for granted, just like nature, seen and unseen. Their way is in the water, rivers, and lakes. They are Mamiwata, looking for people to drown or save so that they are not alone in their liberated states. Moore reclaims invisible histories with characters that move undetected due to society's disregard for their identities and differences. The author shares that the spirit of the wind, Charlotte, was deeply inspired by her own grandmother and asserts that her ubiquity pays homage to Black female identities. Her work encourages exploration beyond the written word into folktales, proverbs, griot narratives, and whispers of the wind. In the close of She Would Be King, Bessa leads an all-male regiment into battle against imperialist forces on the coast of Liberia. The army is a mixture of indigenous Africans and repatriated, liberated Black folk. Bessa stands on the very shores where scores of Africans have been stolen and forced into slavery, her body riddled with bullets with no fear of dying. Her power was living. No matter how many moments and people try to end her life, Bessa lives. She cannot die. Knowing that she will not succumb to her bullet wounds, Bessa thinks to herself, I will not die. As she collapses into the sand, she says aloud, we will not die. And the novel closes. More She Would Be King revises the history of Liberia through three characters who all possess African heritage and supernatural abilities. These characters, Bessa, June Day, and Norman Aragon, represent various spaces in the global South, Liberia, the United States and Jamaica respectively. The three remarkable characters band together like a Black Justice League to rescue African people from being kidnapped into the transatlantic slave trade. Moore's writing guides the reader in imagining heroes of diverse African lineages rescuing the fate of stolen Africans, crafting a narrative where Black people rescue themselves from the treachery of racism. While all three heroes possess powerful supernatural capabilities, it is the lone female, Bessa, who stands out for her mental and spiritual mystic ability not to die. Stifled by patriarchal repression, Bessa is still the most powerful of the heroic trio and most essential to their mission. Her life is a metaphor for the African diaspora and its writers and storytellers. Despite violent marginalization and oppression at the hands of white supremacy like Bessa, Black people have and will survive, and so will our stories. Moore's characterization of Black supernatural characters represented in what we see, what we all see and encounter every day in natural challenges to, uh, in, in, the in the natural room rather, challenges to us to salvage our suffering village with what we have at hand, what and whom we've ignored, our stories and our histories and literature. Her novel and its characters interrupt the Southern literary landscape and challenge the perceived foundations of our origin, origins. 
She would be king weaves together the African diaspora in ways that decenter slavery and trauma as the binding agent of our experiences. Moore's work allows for people of African descent to be seen in everything, everywhere, as a critical part of the fabric of regions and cultures that have ignored and denied the presence. Bessa, Charlotte, Darlene, June Day, Norman, Nani, Safwa are, bond are bonded away from the gaze of white hegemony and dominance. Their Afro histories are linked to global narratives. Yet Moore's voice, like the lives and voices of her characters, was almost lost. The author openly shares the difficulty she experienced with securing a publisher for She Would Be King. The global publishing marketplace did not exhibit interest in the narr narrative of Black liberation at the hands of Black people wielding supernatural power until Black Panther proved to be such a hit at the box office in 2018. The economic success of another Afrofuturist narrative that led publishers, led publishers' acceptance of Moore's imaging of a diasporic history being motivated by Black women and the impending future existing because of a Black woman's undying voice. Moore connects the recent surge of African-based narratives that merge the supernatural and science to Black writers returning to this very culturally authentic method of storytelling, what I call whispering in the wind to save our village. And Moore is not alone in this feat. Other Black female Afrofuturist or speculative, speculative writers such as Octavia Butler, Tanana Reeve Du, Nettie Okafor, W.C. Dunlap, and Tommy Adeyemi have crafted narratives that reclaim Afro his histories and grasp at Black and global healing through the supernatural awareness of Black characters. Y.E. Tumor is of the new vanguard of Black female speculative writers who credit Octavia Butler and other writers with influencing her work and paving a way for a storytelling style that doesn't marginalize our talents, our crafts, doesn't put us in boxes, and that allows us to explore literature and the written word, word in ways that are culturally true. Butler Moore and other, others produce texts that resist and reset the historic erasures of Afro histories and re reconfigure the South and Southern literary landscape. They effectively transgress the inequitable histories that have quieted generations of African people and stories. In her essay, Salvation is the Issue, Tony K. Bambara conveys her belief that the stories that we are told about Black people possess the power to eliminate or preserve life. She maintains that stories are important. They keep us alive. With their rooted, audacious, audacious narratives, Afrofuturist writers, Southern writers such as Wyatt Tumor resist the erasure of Black people in the past and the future. They are whispering in the wind, saving our global village. They are keeping us alive. Thank you. Right. Thank you, Dr. Mama, very much. And yes, that presentation fits this uh, whole literary festival extremely well. It's very exciting when we find some, not just people who died a long time ago, but people who are writing right now and are coming into their career. And it's really exciting to be able to follow them. So thank you very much for bringing her to us. All right, and so finally we have Dr. Brennan Collins gonna talk about Raymond Andrews. Thank you. All right, thank you. And I'm sorry, I don't have any slides, so you're gonna to have to just look at me. Uh, and I, the slides could have been great. Uh, Benny Andrews, who was Raymond's brother, I uh, had sketches in all of his books that are really wonderful. So that's that's a treat if you end up uh, uh, getting any of Andrew's works to see some of the artwork of his brother, Benny, who was uh, quite a famous artist. Uh, so Raymond Andrews wrote about the South uh, in the 70s, 80s, and 90s is when he was publishing. And he was doing so in a way that no other African-American writer was doing at the time. Uh, others have argued this, I've argued this, uh, certainly uh, uh, other writers are writing about the South, but he had a very uh, particular way, uh, particularly uh, with an unflinching gaze uh, on the horrors of the South, but also unapologetic joy about uh, Black Southern culture, particularly rural. Um, with our current political, cultural, and media landscape, I think we might finally be ready for his voice and need it. I think as Andy suggested, uh, Andrews was one of the reasons that prompted uh, uh, starting this conference years ago. And I think many people who read Andrews are puzzled why 
he does not play a more significant role. So while he still is, you can still get his books. Uh, I think it's just that surprise that why aren't people reading him more and discussing him more? So I want to start with a, a quote from Trudier Harris in her 2009 book, Scary Mason Dixon Line. Is there no African-American writer in the South or elsewhere the curious want to know who is not at war with or made uncomfortable by the Southern United States? Certainly the history and blood and slavery is understandable, they continue, but is there no black writer who has managed to transcend that history and is at peace with herself or himself? In other words, is there no black writer who having tunneled her or his way through the pain of history, the muck and mire of psychological, physical or other violations comes out with a healthy response to the South? My answer to those questions has always been to cite Raymond Andrews. So a pretty powerful statement from one of the most prominent African-American literary scholars in the 2000s. And um, I think she would and I would situate this in terms of that debate between Hearst and Zornil Hurston and Richard Wright. Hurston on the one hand, who uh, really paints this beautiful uh, picture of Southern African-American culture in the early 20th century. Uh, and then Wright, who kind of writes about the, the horrors in African-American history. And uh, that, that Andrew somehow does not turn away from the horror, but he is able to see the beauty all at the same time, constantly over and over again. So just in terms of the context of where we are right now, uh, I think probably most of you have heard that Georgia is now a purple state. Uh, I think when you see this, uh, you know, each election, it's the su a surprise, like, oh my God, who would have expected? Uh, and in many ways, maybe we should not be all that shocked, uh, you know, uh, with Raphael Warnock being voted for twice now, John Ossoff elected. Um, and this is in the context of 20 years ago, uh, you know, Democrats, at least at the national level, spent nothing on Georgia. It was kind of written off. The South is written off. And uh, once again, should we be all that shocked that uh, <clears throat> Georgia is a purple state? Uh, speaking to this, Charles Blow, who's a very current New York Times columnist, um, he has advocated for quite some time reverse Black migration specifically to concentrate uh, black political power in the South. Uh, he even moved to Atlanta, uh, kind of following what he has been preaching. Uh, in December of last year, in an article, uh, Unapologetic Black Power in the South, he writes, I heard so many people after the Georgia runoff in which Raphael Warnock defeated Herschel Walker, who said some version of, yes, but it was still too close. It seemed to me that those comments and many others missed the bigger point. Something absolutely historic is happening in Georgia and pretends a massive political realignment for several Southern states. And so I, I agree with uh, what Blow's saying here, but I, I would once again argue this is something that's been in the making for, for decades. And I, I think uh, Blow understands this as well when he uh, in some of his other writings that I'll mention some of, but I, I, would, I would also want to put this in, in the context of the Great Migration, uh, which I'm sure the, the audience is familiar with, uh, you know, early to mid 20th century migration of African Americans to uh, the North, uh, the Midwest, and other parts of the U.S., but it, it feels like uh, the Great Migration is just something in the past decade or two that overall American pop culture or just uh, kind of mainstream understanding of, hey, this thing exists, great, the great migration. Of course, individuals and communities have known this, but really wrapping our heads around like in US history, the importance of the great migration uh, just seems to be something that not until recently, you're hearing stories on NPR or that sort of thing. Um, where as Blow points out recently, and I've pointed out in my dissertation in 2005, 
and William Frey, who has been a demographer for a long time, who's been talking about for years, the reverse of the Great Migration has been happening for 50 years now. Uh, Frey writes, um, this, this reversal of the Great Migration began as a trickle in the 1970s, increased in the 1990s, and turned into a virtual evacuation for many Northern areas in subsequent decades. And I would argue that Raymond Andrews understood all of this in the 1970s. Uh, this is something he was talking about right as that switch is happening, where you have that end of the, the Great Migration and <clears throat> basically the immediate beginning of the return migration of African-Americans to the South. So Raymond Andrews is writing about this in the 70s. Demographers like Frey are starting to talk about that maybe a couple decades later. Uh, but it, it's only just now, I think, in the past few years with the politics and, uh, you know, certainly other cultural things, uh, you know, people wrapping their heads around or be just beginning to wrap their heads around this reverse migration and the, the importance of that. Uh, and Blow is probably the most prominent example. Uh, Maurice Hobson, who's uh, a, a professor at Georgia State University, where I am, wrote uh, uh, Black Mecca talking about Atlanta and talking about this phenomenon as well. So I, I think in terms of this conference, uh, my hope is like, hey, this is something we need to be talking about. And Raymond Andrews is, is in, in, in my opinion, this perfect uh, example of like ways into this discussion of, of what's happening and having so much impact on American history right now. And so, uh, a Andrews did not fit into the publishing world when he was trying to publish in the 70s, 80s, and 90s. Um, part of this is that he comes from an oral tradition. Uh, his voice is very much uh, a, an oral storyteller in, in ways that sometimes just veer greatly from uh, you know, what we might imagine as uh, modern or postmodern fiction in the US. And so first off, uh, you know, several people have argued and I have argued that uh, <laughs> Andrews is the actual narrators of his books. And this is something that is not kind of an acceptable thing to say, right? I, you know, my background is, uh, you know, I've got a PhD in literature and like, that's just something you don't say, that the author is the narrator. That, that's kind of hard to say, but it, it is kind of what's happening with Andrew's work and, and people who knew him and people who've studied him kind of tend to think in that way. Uh, but then there's also things that seem strange in a novel. There's a lot of repetition. Uh, Raymond Andrews will repeat a joke throughout various novels, same joke, because he likes it. He wants to tell us that joke and he's going to tell us when he thinks it's appropriate. Then there's things like call and response and other kind of uh, uh, tropes or, or practices with oral storytelling. Um, probably most importantly in terms of the difficulty of him being published is that he, uh, you know, Raymond Andrews is, is more interested in storytelling, the characters that he's talking about and the culture that he's talking about uh, than he is about plot. And that can sometimes be troubling to readers who are expecting a more standard a uh, piece of writing and a more standard novel that he gets interested in something and he's going to tell us about it. Uh, he sees what's on the table at dinner and he's going to talk about it for a couple of pages. Uh, he's watching this dance and the song that are happening and he's going to veer from the main plot line to tell us this. Uh, and he's constantly doing this. Or there's a character that pops up and then he picks up that character's thread and starts going. These things do get weaved together, uh, but it, it's often disconcerting to a reader who has kind of expectations of here, we're going to follow this plot line. Uh, and, and so I think it was very difficult. And you see this in some of the responses from publishers to his work. If they really like it, they see it's this amazing different thing, but maybe you could focus on the plot a little bit more. Uh, so just as an example of where he does this, this is one of my favorite examples, it's beautiful. Uh, in Rosie Bell Lee, Wildcat, Tennessee, uh, the second novel in his trilogy, um, uh, he talks about the spread on the table after church. So bear with me, it's long, but it's delightful. 
Uh, besides bread, biscuits, and hoe cakes, broken, chewed, or gummed down, all kinds of animals and fowl contributed to the spread. Cooked in their own fashion, the rabbit, squirrel, possum, coon, cow, chicken, turkey, duck, and goose. The pig alone gave up its ears, jowls, tongue, brain, neck, back, shoulders, hams, loins, sausages, chitlins, chops, cracklins, heart, liver, kidneys, rib, feet, knuckles, tail, rump, butt, and balls. Everything as the saying went, but the fart and the squeal. And that's one of the jokes. Like, I think he repeats that twice in Appalachian Red, and he repeats it several times in others. Um, and then he goes on. All of this meat went well with the whole heaps of baked, boiled, fried, stewed, or raw butter beans, snapped peas, black-eyed peas, English peas, Irish potatoes, sweet potatoes, sweet corn, cabbage, kale, collard greens, mustard greens, turnip greens, poke salad, turnips, beets, carrots, rutabagas, rice, okra, pumpkin, squash, onions, scallions, tomatoes, bell peppers, hot peppers, cucumbers, radishes, eggs, butter, dumplings, and stuffing, all sweetened by apple, blackberry, dewberry, mulberry, cherry, peach, pear, plum, pumpkin, and sweet potato pies, chocolate cakes and coconut, cupcakes and tea cakes and shortening bread, cantaloupe and watermelon, and all washed down with gallons of buttermilk and lemonade. So Andrews is constantly doing this veering to culture and just zooming in and, and just going on for pages sometimes in that way. Uh, sometimes like in the middle of a pretty horrific moment, he might describe a dance. Um, he might describe a song that's happening uh, and go into detail. Uh, that, that seems jarring sometimes. And it's not meant, uh, I would argue, and I think others would too, that, that it's not meant to heighten the horror. It is, this is taking place in a context that is horrible sometimes, but uh, he wants to tell us about what's on the table. And so he is the storyteller and he's going to tell us. So just in general, I think uh, at his time, and, and Andrew speaks to this, he felt like publishers didn't know what to do with his work because of his focus on the celebration of rural African-American culture. He also talks about Atlanta and, and uh, his second memoir, Once Upon a Time in Atlanta, but mostly focuses on uh, rural African-American communities. Uh, but speaking to this somewhat of how he felt like this needed to be done and it wasn't being done. Uh, he, he writes this in the preface to the UGA reprinting of his first novel, Appalachie Red. Most Blacks I'd read about in American fiction were treated one-dimensionally as victims, not as complex real people. True Blacks in America have been victimized, but they should not be lumped together in the eyes of others as one type. In our lives, we have our daily soap operas of religious fanatics, intellects, prudes, materialists, radicals, conservatives, murderers, philanthropists, racists, dancers, and cowboys, and all other characters any race of people offers. But sadly, because of television and the cinema, most people now regard Afro-Americans chiefly in terms of the inner city ghettos with their crime, drugs, and poverty. Such a world exists, but it's one I never knew. I could not write honestly about it, even if I wanted. My American roots, like those of most Afro-Americans, are Southern rural. This particular land and the individuals who have lived and died on it are what my books are about. And it's not as if Andrews was the only one who recognized this. Certainly Ellison writes about this. Uh, Morrison writes about this, uh, uh, you know, in the 70s and 80s or earlier with Ellison. Um, but Andrews is doing it and he's doing it from a Southern perspective. Uh, and so as opposed to this looking from a distance of, huh, what are we missing? What, what have we lost by leaving the South that you get from Ellison and Morrison? It's like, here it is. Uh, and Andrews is, is doing that. Um, once again, similar to a way that Zora Neale Hurston do it, did it, but without avoiding the horrors in the way that, that Zora Neale Hurston does not focus on. Uh, Andrews has these things uh, constantly mixed together. So, and by doing this, he often disrupts kind of standard versions of important historical moments or movements uh, in the African-American South and the US. And so he has a very nuanced view that I think was perhaps disturbing to some publishers 
uh, though I think uh, increasingly more understood now, um, about the civil rights movement. So in Appalachia Red, his first novel, novel, he portrays the movement as a coming apocalypse. So this necessary and just destruction of the white power structure. But in his novels, it comes with serious cost to black communities. And, and he, the storyteller, is very skeptical of the gains of the movement. Uh, this is probably best seen uh, in the third novel of his trilogy, Baby Sweets, uh, where Red's Cafe, uh, which in the first novel uh, was the center of power and wealth in the Black community, uh, this restaurant, a uh, place where you could get illegal liquor, uh, go dancing, gamble. Um, after the civil rights movement and the economic decline that occurs after the Black community can go to any restaurant they want, uh, the house is turned into a brothel for white men to see Black women. Uh, so pretty harsh statements about some of the economic and cultural, you know, post-civil rights, uh, a lot of skepticism about that, even though he does absolutely portray it as this coming of justice to the South. Uh, so an example of this, I'll read from Baby Sweets, uh, where he's in this brothel that he's set up. I've uh, got this, once again, this, this piece that brings together the horrors of the South, as well as possibility, uh, pleasure and uh, community that's possible uh, in the South. Um, so, uh, and be prepared, lots of cursing here. Uh, Rob suddenly felt himself, so this is a black bouncer is about to have to throw out uh, a white patron, uh, which everyone suddenly gets very nervous uh, because what, what will this cause? Uh, Rob suddenly felt himself being abruptly and painfully yanked up off the floor by the back of the collar and quickly turning his neck around, he saw speeding his way a black fist, which he lost nary a split lip second addressing, don't hit me motherfucker. At the word, the fist put on its air brakes. Never before had the black fist's owner heard motherfucker rolling off a pair of foreign white lips, whose God-given word he'd grown up believing was son of a bitch. Though the fist's owner uttered the expression motherfucker every other breath, at least, even he didn't know that it was the Afro-American's first contribution to the English language. The expression originated among black youngsters back during slavery when their white masters would steal back into the slave quarters to fuck the children's mothers. These whites were hated by the youngsters and thus derogatorily referred to as motherfuckers, the vilest. Suddenly feeling that if here stood a white son of a bitch motherfucker enough to call a motherfucking in motherfucker to his motherfucking face, then Snake felt this cracker son of a bitch must have been an all right motherfucker. Thus, instead of fat lipping the motherfucker, the black fist suddenly unclitched and in midair into a friendly family of five, which slapped themselves approvingly on the motherfucking shoulders of the surprised white son of a bitch, motherfuck. And so you have kind of this blending of clearly this pleasure in language, uh, but with this horrific folk etymology, uh, uh, understanding that this represents the kind of worst of the South and its history and uh, and and but at the same time, this reveling in language, this reveling in possibility, uh, this twisting of the word motherfuck, motherfucker, to do all kinds of things: negative, positive, uh, adjective, uh, noun, uh, just going all over the place. And this is what we see in Andrew's work. Uh, also, during that scene in the background, you have the signifying monkey being played on a. Uh, piano by a very light-skinned prostitute who shows up late in the novel who will only see black men and so they have to set up another area of the brothel. Uh, so you just have all these twists and turns and reversals going over and over and over again in the book. So one more example of this challenging of kind of typical narratives and then I'll finish. Uh, we have in the first novel Appalachian Red this interesting reversal of uh, typical slave narratives. So uh, Red, who's one of the main characters, the title character, is being brought home in the brig uh, in prison on a ship after World War II, and he comes into New York 
and here's the quotation. Shortly after reaching New York, while his ship sat, sat docked for several hours in the harbor, he and the rest of the prisoners of war were brought on deck to get their souls sunned before being allowed re-entry into the door of the home of the brave. So literally like in other narratives, you have this ship coming in and it's bringing him in chains. Uh, he's allowed to go up on board. Uh, and that's when our red had had enough. He jumped ship right overboard into the water where he didn't stop swimming until he reached the banks of the Oconee and Appalachie, where while on the move down through Jersey, he had decided to make his way to make his stand. Yes, to make his motherfucking stand in the very house where he was born in which he had been railroaded out of as a baby to the North and hoped for oblivion. So I think with the, the storytelling aspect of the book and, and and some of the ways that he's reversing certain narratives that, that we've come to expect and accept, uh, Andrews had trouble getting published uh, or had trouble getting traction. Uh, and he you know, did get critical praise early on, but uh, he had a lot of frustration about this. And, and I, I think really, you know, over the past 20 years, we do see changes in kind of the acceptable stories and the voices that are being heard. But I do hope and I do, uh, and I, once again, it's always seems surprising to me that we're not reading Raymond Andrews. So thank you. All right, thank you, Brennan. So uh, we have two questions in the Q&A and they're both about Raymond Andrews. Um, so I'd like to, to bring back Jeffrey and Ebony first with a question and then get to those about uh, Raymond Andrews. So I'll start with uh, Jeffrey who went first about uh, Henry Dumas. Um, one of the things I'd like to ask about is, I remember the first time I read the story Arc of Bones and I was literally in shock. I had to immediately just start over and read it all over again. Um, the most shocking thing is how prodigious his talent was. Um, and he really reminded me I didn't even think of an author. I thought of a musician. I'm like he's this guy is like John Coltrane with mm. prose. Because like if someone asks, "What does John Coltrane's music sound like?" It's like which album, <laughs> which period, ballads, blues, highly experimental, spiritual. It it just depends, and that's what I see in Dumas. He just writes whatever he wants in whatever genre he wants. Uh, when you're reading an Echo Tree, stories just the genres just completely change story to he he's just incredibly talented so i ask a little bit about the breadth of his talent poetry prose whatever he wrote it seemed to be brilliant he certainly uh andy was was fluid uh in in that regard with poetry and and prose i'd, I'd say his uh, his fiction is probably a little better known, though uh, many of you may be familiar with the Black Book, 1973 or 1974, that came out by Random House. Middleton Harris was the editor, but Toni Morrison was the senior editor of that project. And if you look through the Black Book, there are uh, sprinkled throughout uh, lines of poetry from Dumas in, in that book. And so that shows how much Morrison thought of him and, and his poetry. Uh, and uh, to the point about music, uh, shortly before he uh, was killed on May 23rd, 1968, he was coming from uh, Sun Ra's apartment. He had, He spent time with the uh, experimental jazz musician Sun Ra and uh, what they termed uh, their orchestra, right? And so, uh, in fact, he had had a pretty heated exchange with Sun Ra and Sir Sun Ra, according to his biographer, uh, John Zwed, had a bad feeling about where Henry was emotionally and mentally and Later, he would lament the fact that he uh, didn't insist that, that Henry remain there because he left there and shortly thereafter, 
he had the encounter with the transit officer and, and he was killed. So, uh, and, and uh, if you're reading Echo Tree uh, and even in Play Ebony, Play Ivory, uh, there, there are fictional references to Sun Ra and uh, references in uh, Play Ebony, Play Ivory to, to Sun Ra. So of the musical influences on Henry, I would say Sun Ra was probably the most uh, profound in that regard. Thank you. And we, uh, there's, a, there's also a question in the chat asking if you would read some of this poetry or something you think is representative give people a good mm. sense of uh, it. Well, I'll read, just give me a second. I'll, I'll read a couple of lines from a couple of poems, if, if you like. And so this comes from uh, Son of Sippy. Up from Sippy I grew, bear walk and cane stalk, make a hungry belly talk. And let me go to another one. So let me make sure I got the right page. Oh. This is from Take This River. We move up a spine of earth that bridges the river and the canal, and where a dying white log, finger-like, floating off the bank, claws at the slope. We stumble and we laugh. We slow beneath the moon's eye, near the shine of the river's blood face. The canal's veil of underbrush sweats frost, and this ancient watery scar retains the motionless tears of men with troubled spirits. For like the whole earth, this land of mine is soaked. Shadows together, we fall on the grass without a word. We had run this far from the town. We had taken the bony course, rocky and narrow, he leading, I following. And uh, take this river, this is it's about uh, two young black men who are fleeing uh, Klansmen in, in town and they're following the river. And the speaker is, you know, reflecting on what the river represents uh, in terms of their journey. And if if we have a moment, and, and there might be a question for Ebony, uh, and we could go uh, to Ebony. And then if we have another moment, I'll share uh, some of his comments about his journey or related to his journey in Saudi Arabia. Okay, so. Uh, but I wanna make sure, sure everyone's sure. able to hear all the panelists. Sure, so Ebony, a question for you in the Q and A is, uh, Evan, this is from Pearl, another, um, can you and do you teach she would be king in what context or course? Uh, thanks, Pearl. I do. I've taught this book probably more than uh, many of the books in, in my repertoire, and it's only been uh, out since 2018. And so I've taught it in an African diasporic lit course. I've also ta taught it in an Africana, uh, this semester in an Africana women's literature course, but it's also right for Afrofuturist uh, courses, depending on the perspective that you'd be be taking their sort of representation across the board. It could also be taught uh, in conjunction with uh, courses that are more historical or based in history, because what Moore does is this retelling of uh, Liberia's founding and the background that leads up to it. But she does it I, I, in this form of what I call faction. So there, there are plenty of facts there, but it's mixed with uh, this supernatural fiction that imagines uh, different endings and different beginnings and fills in the gaps of sort of lost Afro histories. And so uh, it could also be taught in, I think, an innovative Southern literature course because Waitumor, uh, while she 
is born in Liberia. Her family uh, has to escape during the Civil War when she's five years old. And so uh, her memoir, The Dragons, the Giant, and the Women, is about that escape. And it embodies these beautiful, whimsical, supernatural elements where, though her family's going through this traumatic this traumatic time in the country is uh, sort of being torn apart, there are all of these moments of magic and supernatural uh, intuition and, and whimsy that kind of ground it as a children's story that turns into this adult narrative about where her life is going and how what she describes herself doing, tethering herself to her homeland. And so uh, she, her family escapes and she settles and is raised uh, and lived her life in Texas. Uh, before moving as an adult to, to New York City. And so I think there's an innovative approach that could be made here to uh, Southern literature, right? The global South of her starting in Liberia and then um, and then being living and being raised in Texas, but also in this book, it, it paints this uh, remarkable trifecta of African diasporic connections and she would be king and starting in Virginia, as I mentioned, uh, in the presentation, and then you've got char a character in Jamaica, and then you've got a character who's in the indigenous space that becomes Liberia, and they all converge on African soil and kind of do this reverse middle passage uh, travel with the wind guiding them the entire way. And so uh, there's so many options with where this text, I think, fits. And um, it's unfortunate that it, she she publishes it, and then we go into this global uh, pandemic, which I think affects, you know, what was engaged and, and what stories were valued over others. All right, thank you. So i uh, got one question specifically about Raymond Andrews and one for everybody. They're both from someone we're very excited to attending. It's Chris Andrews, Christopher Andrews. He's the nephew of Raymond Andrews and co-executor of the Raymond Andrews estate. And he's written these very eloquently written questions. So Brennan, so specifically about Raymond Andrews, uh, how might Raymond Andrews' actively acknowledged mixed African-American and European-American ancestry and heritage uh, relate to his relevance and being able to mediate between these worlds and viewpoints? Well, and I think it's particularly with the Andrews family and, and uh, you know, it's, it's not just the kind of... Uh, 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 mixed uh, ancestry. It's the particular story too that you know having uh, a grandmother who gets land uh, from a wealthy white landowner. That uh, then when he loses all his money, he has to move on to her property. Uh, it kind of definitely affects the kind of family legends uh, and kind of, yes, this this uh, this particular lens. But uh, so certainly we see one with Appalachian Red, this reversal once again of a tragic mulatto stereotype, right? Uh, Red is not tragic. He is an actor and in control of everything. Uh, in his adult life uh, and because he's made sure of it. And it is his biracial ambiguity that allows him to take power, uh, confusing the, you know, white sheriff uh, and who can't understand him as uh, a black. Uh, so there's that, but also, and, and I think it's interesting in his unpublished work, uh, that a little bit has been published of, he definitely goes into uh, his mother's side of the family as well. So his father's side of the family has that um, mixed ancestry uh, and, and very complex and kind of veering from a lot of other stories of that. But his mother's family, uh, uh, not of that mixed ancestry, like he focuses on in this unpublished work that is very much about property ownership and the importance of African Americans to own property and to own guns uh, are a big part of his argument that you have to own property, uh, not be reliant on whites and, uh, and protect. Uh, and so he has these various stories, one of kind of 
the racial ambiguity of red. Um, and, and he even in his own, in his memoirs, talks about this a great deal uh, when he comes to Atlanta and sometimes passes, but then gets uh, to, to ride the bus in a particular way or whatever, but then also gets busted uh, and gets in pretty uh, uh, scary situations. And so, um, yeah, I mean, it's all throughout his work. And and so I think, I, I don't know if others have read the book Incognito. it's a, a, a comic uh, and does this wonderful job of, based on kind of the story of Walter White, not, not of recent fame, but uh, head of NAACP, who, uh, you know, went in to report on um, uh, uh, lynchings and was able to pass at lynchings and could report on them uh that it's this comic based on that and it, it once again it's it's transforming that tragic stereotype of mixed race heritage of of making it a superpower uh and i think raymond andrews is very interested in that of of transforming this thing that often has been seen and typically in literature seen as a tragedy and making it a superpower even. Uh, so yeah, I mean, right. it's, the family story is so amazing and interesting, but uh, yeah. Brennan, is, is there much scholarship on Andrews and uh, Hurston uh, just in, in terms of, I mean, you alluded to Hurston earlier. They, they really do seem to have some interesting parallels uh, in terms of their own sort of uh, middle class like family backgrounds in terms of uh, property and and you know the history of Eatonville and uh, notions of self sufficiency and uh, black achievement. I, I'm just wondering, are there any comparative studies uh, of those two writers? Yes, you know, Hurston certainly gets mentioned. I mean, there's not a great deal of work on okay. Raymond Andrews, but certainly Hurston is mentioned sometimes. Uh, certainly, there there's clear connections between kind of the celebration of Black rural life. Uh, the criticism often put on Hurston, fairly or unfairly, uh, is that she tends to not focus on struggle uh kind of uh historic tensions and and the atrocities of uh you know american history uh where raymond andrews is, is celebrating as much as hurston is but has no problem zeroing in and telling uh brutal brutal stories at the same time so uh, there's a little bit but because there's very little scholarship on Andrews. Um, yes, it comes up a little bit, but there's not like a, a huge amount. And, and to be fair also, I wrote my dissertation on Andrews. And like you were saying before, I have a lot of administrative duties. And, you know, my role as faculty member has always been in faculty development and not necessarily on the literature side. So while I do occasionally teach Andrews, it's been a while since I've really focused on uh, uh, kind of scholarship around Andrew. Right. So perhaps recent, and, and so Trudier Harris, of course, you know, major scholar, uh, certainly has interest in Andrews and says these remarkable things about him, which once again, just makes me puzzled. It's like, why are more people not interested when she says he is the one author who's not afraid of the South? Uh, so uh, yeah, uh, but I, I might not be up to date fully, so maybe there's a huge literature there, but certainly there, there's definite interesting connections between Hearst and, and Andrew's experience. All right, we're getting a lot of really good questions, so if everyone doesn't mind going on for a few minutes, we'll, we'll get to them all. So this question is also from Chris Andrews, and it's for the entire panel. Um, so I have an observation and a question for both the panel and for all of us. The South has such a deep treasure of stories and writers. And this is coming from someone who lives in the Bay Area. So it's extra complimentary. Uh, and the dramatic narrative industry is avidly mining lost intellectual property for what is termed creative and relevant content to bring to a global audience. So what efforts, if any, are being made and can be made to match Southern writers' voices to the content-hungry entertainment machine? 
And also how can that various machine help advance and leverage that work so it may best serve the modern world? Hmm. <laughs> so it's very good how, because that's really the best way to revive a voice or to bring more exposure to an emerging voice is if a movie gets made or a TV show or they get. Well, I, I would say, and I don't, I don't actually, I don't know where he's from originally, but, uh, and, and he will have his critics, but uh, you all, or some of you are, are there in Atlanta and I think Tyler Perry is engaged in a, a, a kind of um, uh, effort to uh, monetize, right? Not necessarily in a negative or, or uh, yeah, not in a negative way, but he's creating space for Black creative people to do film and television at a scale that might be unprecedented. I, I, I don't know, I'm, I'm not uh, a student of, of, of film production and history, but his impact on TV and, and film vis-a-vis -vis not only creating black content, but employing large numbers of black people uh, in his studios there in Atlanta is, I think, an effort to start to take advantage of, in, in a financial sense, uh, Black talent and Black stories, right? Now, you can critique how he does it, right? But the effort, I think, is uh, significant. And, you, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll leave it at that. Yeah, I, I would think about what always makes me nervous about taking stories from particular, you know, marginalized communities and making them accessible to global audiences are the shifts and changes and the edits and revisions that happen in order to serve the, the appetites of that global audience. And so um, I think to Jeffrey's point, Spike Lee is, has been doing a lot of that work uh, as well for the duration of, of, of my entire life. Uh, and if I speak specifically about Afrofuturist uh, expressions, which uh, I mentioned in the presentation, once, once the market saw what Black Panther did and the, the, the rage about it, then there was this door sort of open for certain types of narratives, but it was a, still a very narrow door uh, in terms of what Spike Lee has done, there's a Netflix, straight to Netflix film, See You Yesterday, which uh, features a young Black female lead in tech and science, and there's this supernatural intuition. I'm sure no one has heard of it or watched it. Mm -hmm. And uh, this, is, this is a film that just uh, debuted, I think, last year. Um, maybe 2021. And so, no, I don't think it's that old. And so there's this avenue for it, but it's interesting to see what the, those appetites are. There's also um, the series Lovecraft Country, which had the ratings, it had the acclaim, but was still canceled. And so one of the things I see about, um, especially Southern writers, like we're often writing about uh, these traumas and trying to correct some histories or embed where the spaces and gaps are. Uh, there, there does seem to be this, uh, this sort of pushback against how much of the story you can share and in what way those stories can be purveyed that can stop, you know, full stop. These, these narratives will never make it into the global marketplace. But then there's a part of me that thinks about uh, signifying and that everything ain't for everybody. So there's some of the, these treasures and these narratives and uh, stories that communities are entitled to hold and keep and purvey in the way that is most judicious to the purpose of the stories. And so, you know, that I mean, it's, it's such a, a, a sticky area. Do we want to share uh, so much? And then at what point is that sharing sort of halted because it doesn't serve, um, you know, the dominant cultures thirst? Right. Well, and, and 
I, I, I know, uh, you know, Chris is asking the question and, and partially, you know, this is something that they and we are thinking about, uh, you know, of how do you get kind of the stories that Raymond Andrews uh, was telling, how do you get that to a Netflix, to Broadway, to, uh, you know, uh, movies and, and, Certainly, you know, Donald Glover comes to mind with uh, with Raymond Andrews for me, as well as Spike Lee, as well as like a Tarantino. Uh, and, and uh, you know, I, I think it, it's quite, it could work. I would love to see it work. I, I think Ebony's correct. You know, you've always got to worry about, yeah, the appetites of a worldwide audience and what does that turn the thing into? Uh, but even then, uh, you know, you get something and and maybe thousands and thousands of people end up reading the book, too, which is, I guess, uh, uh, positive, even in the possibility of the negatives of it being kind of rewritten and restructured. Uh, Raymond Andrews' work, in some ways, is very difficult, just like I was saying, that it was very difficult for the publishing world to see, like, how does this fit within, how are we going to advertise this, how is it going to fit into what we normally publish, uh, is probably true of of the film industry as well, but you know we have such a huge kind of explosion of good TV and experimental storytelling. And once again, uh, Glover, who I think is the best example of that, uh, of really truly experimenting with the form, uh, and it's focused on Atlanta uh, and the South. Uh, so. That's who I want to get it in the hands of. The Spike Lee would be great too uh, if we could get in Spike Lee's hands. I actually, Pearl asked, well, she said we need to send Andrew's books to Spike Lee. I know the story from back when Raymond Andrews was alive, which is uh, Appalachian Red came out. And it was sort of in the same cycle as The Color Purple by Alice Walker, which Hollywood did pick up, but it was very much we're only doing one black novel at a time. And this is the one that's going to get made. Um, but later, Raymond Andrews did write to Spike Lee and asked him to look at his works. Okay. And at that point, um, it was early in Spike Lee's career when he did not adapt material. He wrote all of his own scripts. They were all original. And so he just simply responded, I don't do adaptations. But now he does adaptations. So Pearl's right. Now's the time to send it back to him. Um, so two other questions about uh, Raymond Andrews. Um, one is what authors was Raymond Andrews reading? And also um, Chip Bell posted that um, Ray's brother, Benny, and his dad, George, were both artists. And what influence did art play in his writings in terms of the style of the novels? Uh, you know, I, I guess with the question about what books he was reading, I, I'm not really sure. You know, he talks a bunch about being a kid and like going to movies all the time. He talks in his memoir about going to movies all the time. So that he was definitely consuming a lot of uh, media and stories. Uh, but I'm not sure, you know, what all Ray was reading. Uh, you know, I, I have to think uh, Faulkner just because one, the world creating that he's doing similar to kind of Yaknapatapa County uh, with his Muskegon trilogy. Um, and also definitely playing off of Joe Christmas some, um, definitely playing off of uh, um, A Light in August with the way Appalachian Red ends. Uh, so like I it definitely Faulkner, but that that's just so I I, I do not know. Uh, with, with yeah, absolutely, you know, Benny was this incredibly famous artist, um, uh, very much nationally and internationally recognized. And and Ray and Benny grew up very close, and and he talks about the stories, or they both talk about the stories of. Uh, you know, Benny making drawings and Ray creating stories around those drawings. And so as Ray starts writing, um, you know, Benny ends up illustrating uh, pieces of it. So you have these amazing sketches throughout uh, Ray's work. Uh, and so definitely an influence in that way, um, uh, just kind of growing up and doing this back and forth between uh, kind of sketches and storytelling. 
Um, I, but other than that, I, I don't know what to, to say. All right, so uh, last, um, well, you addressed this question somewhat about Benny's illustrations. The, the Benny, Raymond's brother, who was a very famous um, painter himself, um, and was actually the more famous of the two. Oh, yeah, yeah. Um, illustrated uh, Raymond's novels. And it was a question about the creative collaboration between the brothers. I, I mean, I can, I can show some of the incredible images in Appalachian Red just because it's sitting right here. Um, you've got Clyde Boots White, who's... Uh, the villain of the novel who interestingly are one of the villains of the novel uh, but who interestingly I just read it again after a long time of not having read it and he barely shows up like he, he's there in the beginning and there in the end but it doesn't show up much once again because Andrews is interested in uh, the black community um, but it's it's worthwhile just kind of going through and and looking at at the sketches there um but uh, was was there an added question to that i i was i got excited to go show the book <laughs> okay um no it was no it was just about talking about their creative collaboration which they did throughout their their lives yeah. all right so we're getting close to 2 30 so i want to thank all of our panelists and all of our guests and like I said at the beginning, this is a, I knew before the panel started, this was going to be a really exciting one. Th these are three, you know, lost voices can range from, well, let's not forget this person to this is someone who should be in all the literary anthologies. This is a major, major talent. And these are three major talents. These are three authors who absolutely should be read. And I'm really grateful to have had the chance to, to moderate it. And I want to thank everyone again. And I think we're up against our time, so we'll we'll end it here. But uh, thank everyone, and look forward to our next panel on Tennessee writers.